So it's my pleasure today to introduce and welcome Professor Marty Andres to Princeton and to the Brad Seminar here at noon. Professor Andres is a professor at Arizona State University in the School of Human Evolution, Social Change, and one other school, which is School of Sustainability. It's a school of sustainability, having earned his PhD in applied mathematics at the University of British Columbia. His work over the last two decades has covered many topics of great interest to all of us who attend this seminar. Indeed, if I was to read through just the very interesting publications he was part of, I could not finish it in the hour we have here to, uh, this afternoon. Instead, let me try to give you a flavor of some of the topics and foci of his, of his research and those of his colleagues and co-workers by just taking some phrases from the titles of his publications. So let me just say just a few words at a time and you'll get the flavor of the kind of issues that interest him. Adaptive capacity, tipping points, sustainability risks, resilient pathways, coupled infrastructure systems, social ecological systems, a topology of nonlinear global carbon dynamics, robustness in social ecological systems, human behavior, institutions, and regulatory feedback on public policy. So as you can see, he and his colleagues have deployed a wide variety of techniques uh, to address these very, very serious problems we're all facing. And you can see uh, up here on the slide, what Professor Andrews is going to speak to us about today, mainly just to read the title up there, Governance of Social Resources in the Face of Global Change, Some Experimental and Theoretical Reflections. Welcome to Princeton. Thank you very much. I, I don't feel like I even have to give a talk now. You introduced me in such a way. Thank you all for coming. And uh, let me thank the, the Princeton Environment Institute and the STEP program for inviting me here. I've already had very many interesting conversations with people today. And hopefully, we'll have many more and, and uh, have one right here. Uh, given the backgrounds of people here, I'm guessing are quite broad. Rather than delve into a particular uh, study narrowly, I am going to give you kind of a trajectory of research employing different methods uh, that my group at Arizona State University and the Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment have deployed over the past, uh, I would say, decade or so to try to deal with this problem of <clears throat> governing shared resources. So let me see if I can get this to work. So there's the pointer. This goes forward. OK, so here are the overarching questions that we focus on. How do we design governance structures for the interactions between humans and our artifacts and the environment when there is variability and deep uncertainty. There are conflicting goals. And there are social dilemmas around shared resources. So I've had several conversations about sustainability. What is sustainability? Well, this is how we think about sustainability. And if we want to use a more jargony uh, phrase to describe this, maybe more succinct but less meaningful, is how do we build resilient coupled infrastructure systems that embody principles of justice across generations and species? So that's the overarching goal of what we do. <clears throat> And we always focus on shared resources because they're the difficult ones. So here are the two big shared resources that are in the news and in scientists' minds, the forefront of our thinking today. We've got the climate and, well, the atmosphere and the ocean, which together make the climate, which together make the planetary system. Of course, we've got some land in there as well, but that's just such a nice photo I had to show it. And uh, the second kind of shared infrastructure that we can think about is much less out there in the public consciousness, but it is irrigated agriculture. It's very important. And there are several types of shared infrastructure in uh, agricultural systems. And for us, what is most interesting, partially because of our intellectual history, is small-scale agri small agricultural systems. Let me try to convince you that they're important. Uh, irrigated agriculture consumes lots of water, produces lots of agricultural commodities on a pretty concentrated land area. And what's really important is that a lot of the farms, most of the farms worldwide are tiny. They're very much like the ones you see here. And these tiny farms worldwide, uh, they feed a lot of the world's poorest people. Now, I won't stand behind these numbers too strong. They come from the FAO and other sources. But they're in the ballpark. Irrigated, small scale irrigated agriculture is important globally. Uh, so what are, these, uh, what are these communities facing? I've got a picture here of India. 
This shows you this inset picture here. This just illustrates some of the challenges they face here. You see this blue area. The rainfall in 2009 in the blue area was 23 to 30% above normal, while the average across India was 23% uh, below normal. So you've got general reduction in water availability over large areas, but also increased variability and in, increased storm intensity and infrastructure damage in concentrated areas. <clears throat> And we've got shifting in the timing of the monsoons in these areas. At the same time, they're facing social economic challenges. There are new wage opportunities that are drawing attention away from these communities. And uh, there's new, there new complex technologies and complex market interactions where small-scale farmers are having to buy these packets of inputs that forces them to take financial risks that they don't understand and they're not ready to deal with. So these small-scale agriculturalists are being hit in all different directions with challenges to maintaining their livelihoods and producing food for many, many people. <clears throat> this is a picture from the FAO just to give you a sense of the uh, projected impact of changing climate on agriculture over the next 50 or so years. Red means less and green means more. It's not really important what the numbers are here. You can see down here. But I just wanted to show you where the studies are that I'll be talking about today that we focused on in our research group here in Columbia. Uh, we don't have anything in India and what I'll talk about today, although we do work there, Nepal, Thailand, and China. I put Arizona State, uh, sorry, Arizona State, there it is, Arizona there because we do work a lot in Arizona, but I won't talk about that today. Okay, so uh, here are the organizing principles just to give you a summary before I leap into the next step. The uh, adaptive capacity of these small-scale CISs, coupled infrastructure systems, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means to us later, is important for sustainable food production globally. It's not just maintaining small-scale agriculture. It's, a, it's an important problem globally. The governance of shared resources at the irrigation community scale is important. It's highly unlikely that uh, government will be able to intervene at this scale to provide the infrastructure that these communities provide now. So governance at that scale is important. And finally, what are the determinants and limits to this governance capacity? That final question is what I'll talk about today. What are the determinants of this adaptive capacity and what are its limits? The intellectual framework that we use to, to um, guide our research comes from our long interaction with Lynn Ostrom, uh, an institutionalist, a political economist, who developed the institutional analysis and development framework that uh, provides some structure. Just to clarify the meaning, institutions, we see those as rules and norms that structure repeated interactions between individuals over time. And we see governance as this, the clusters of institutions, organizations, practices, physical assets that are required to actualize those institutions. So governance is this broad construction uh, of infrastructure that implements or uh, enables institutions. We focus on action situations. Action situations, we're in an action situation now. We come together. There are certain norms and rules that we, that we use to, to structure our interactions. More generally, uh, action situations are situations where people come together, exchange information, make decisions, share resources. Governance. Action situations are governance. And they are, they are impacted and constructed by biophysical conditions, attributes of the community, and rules in use. So as I go through my talk, I will talk about how each of these impacts different action situations and, and what the action situations are will become clear as I go. You can see here there's a feedback structure embedded in this uh, diagram, and we'll talk a lot about that as well as I go on. Okay. How does the research that we do play out? I'm doing this so that you can, you can link together in your minds the four pieces of research that I'm going to talk about uh, after this slide. We uh, are very case study focused. We, we look to small scale agricultural systems, fisheries, forest, groundwater systems to uh, extract key themes either through comparative analysis or single case study analysis at a sort of deep ethnographic level. Then we do one of two things. This, this is a method, right? Comparative analysis, careful method. Key theme, an example of key themes that would come from comparative analysis would be Lynn's design principles that you would read in Governing the Commons. She extracts those themes from comparing 150 case studies around the world empirically. So that is a research method that we employ. But myself and my close colleagues, we tend to be over here a little bit more. We love to build dynamic models to understand adaptive capacity, resilience, robustness, and then we, uh, we also are interested in attributes of the community. How do individuals make decisions? Because in the end, 
in the feedback, it's the people making decisions that generate that feedback dynamic, which then generates the dynamics of the coupled infrastructure systems. So what I'm going to do is run through <coughs> um, two dynamic models and two experiments, not in that order. First, a dynamic model, two experiments, and then finishing up with kind of a general dynamic model. So this is one of the systems that we focused on at the beginning of this, this research trajectory. This is the Pumpet River in Nepal, and it's associated with the Pumpet irrigation system. You can see it has very specific biophysical factors that really condition what people do in terms of governance here. It's very steep. It's a, it's a north-south system. So in Nepal, you can imagine Nepal is like my arm here. North-south systems coming out of the foothills are very steep. East-west systems are very flat. Very different animals when you study them in terms of governance. So this one's very steep, and you can see the steep topography as well. So it's a very compact <coughs> uh, irrigation system. The key uh, type, one of the key uh, human-made infrastructure elements here is the, the uh, main canal offtake, the main headworks that divert water from the main river here into a canal over here. These are, take the form of what's called a gabion box structure, which is just a pile of rocks wrapped in wire. Very adaptive, very effective. The water then flows through a canal here that goes through a mountain. And that kind of, uh, that kind of biophysical context has implications for how people perceive shared resources, in fact. Goes through this mountain, comes out the other side, and then there's a complex uh, collection of small-scale infrastructure that distributes it to the fields as necessary. I've just shown you some examples of hard human-made infrastructure here. So the problem they have to solve is to get water in the right place at the right time with the right plants, which is the fundamental problem of agriculture. Right? So this is, this, is the, this is the formal conceptualization that we construct from this, this biophysical model you see in the back, or the biophysical system you see in the background. This is the Pumper River. The head gate's right there. The canal through the mountain is there. And then on the other side, there are six sectors. 120 households, about 20 households in each sector. They grow rice paddy. And um, the head gate constraint is important. So notice this green band here. I guess it doesn't look so green. But in this band, you want to keep your water level in your paddy at that level over the growing season. <clears throat> and there's a complex uh, water level structure that's required for the physiology of rice. And as always, it seems, we humans t do this to ourselves. We, we, we try to put a plant where, that needs the most water when the water level is the lowest. So here's the water flow in the Pumper River. It goes up. And then this is the head gate constraint. They can't move any more than 0.6 cubic meters per second through that main canal. And then the, the water drops off after the monsoons. Monsoons typically arrive June, you know, mid-June, early June, uh, and then last through October. Uh, but then the water uh, level drops off. But that's OK. You don't need it anyway at that point. So what do the, what do the uh, agriculturalists do? <clears throat> uh, they coordinate their water use to avoid falling outside of the band. This band here, this gray band, is a blow up of the early part of the season when the, the situation's most difficult. And if you fall below that, you experience a drought. If you go above that, you experience a flood. So you want to stay in that bound. And what do they do? They actually have adaptive institutions. So we ask the question, you may have heard that, adaptive governance, adaptive institutions. What does that exactly mean? Well, here in this model, we're very explicit. They have a set of different institutional regimes that they shift into when they have to as water becomes more or less scarce. So if there's plenty of water, <clears throat> they, they practice open flow, meaning all the canals are open. Each sector can take water as it pleases, because there's plenty of water. When water becomes more scarce, they switch to a sequential rotation. This is a, <clears throat> this is a tanda rotation, if any of you are interested, uh, know of the Valencia stories, the famous Valencia irrigation systems, where you take your turn. So sector one gets all the water it wants, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six. And uh, this, this pattern is historically based. <clears throat> and it adds interesting nuance to the story that I won't be able to go into here. Then they move into a 12 and a 24-hour clock rotation, which is called the Turno rotation in the Valencia case, to relate it to that very famous case for studying institutions. And uh, there is an upstream downstream asymmetry, so there's a power asymmetry upstream and downstream that causes difficulties in negotiations. And the final thing I wanted to point out is they have to be able to mobilize labor for canal maintenance and repair. Those biophysical features of the system really dictate how they deal with uh, governance. So the, our question is, well, does their capacity to switch in between and maintain this rather complex adaptive institutional form increase their capacity to cope with global change? So that's the, the question we're dealing with. 
So this, these graphs show you the main results, and uh, they illustrate exactly this capacity. So you see the green curve here, that's this a sigmoidal shaped curve. This is the mean river discharge. From 100 to 50 percent, open flow is fine. We wouldn't expect them to do anything. Because of, remember, doing things costs, right? They have to negotiate, they have to coordinate. So they're not going to do it if they don't have to. But if mean river discharge falls below 50 percent, the, the, uh, the amount of water, the yield drops to zero. You can imagine the canals just get too low and nobody can get enough water, so they lose the whole thing. If they switch at 50 percent from open flow to sequential or optimized sequential, optimized sequential uh, uh, in the model, you know, agents aren't very smart in these models, so we, we have some more or less smart agents. It doesn't really matter. If they switch, they can prevent total loss. So they switch, they, you know, they maintain 50, 30, 20, and even 20 percent is a lot better than nothing. So it does make sense that they would do this, and this is, in fact, exactly what they do. They switch from open flow to sequential when water becomes scarce. The model is beautifully consistent with what we see in the field. By the way, this paper was written by, a, uh, led by a, a two engineers who are robust control specialists, myself. And uh, Ashok Regmi is a political scientist who studied with Lynn, who grew up in Nepal and was our field person uh, who really helped us understand the system. Same thing is true for the time shift in the monsoons. Uh, <clears throat> up to 25, 20 days late, three weeks, no problem. They can, they can maintain open flow. If it's beyond three weeks, though, again, they shift to sequential, and they can maintain some yield. So they increase their robustness to changing climate. That's what the picture shows. But the interesting feature of this system to us when we first, or this picture when we first got it, was the fact that the 12 and 24 hours never make sense. They're always dominated by another strategy. So we said to our colleague, w when do they do 12 and 24 hour rotations? When would they do this clock rotation? Because they sure shouldn't do it according to the model. And he said, you know what? I, I, let me call my, my contacts back in Nepal. Let me, let me ask some more questions. Because when he was there, and this is the problem with field research, he wasn't asking these questions because he had his own research agenda as well. So he went back and asked, and they said, indeed, we never use 12 and 24 hour rotations unless there's really major scarcity re uh, related to a headgate washout. They have to mobilize labor quickly, and then they shift. Sure enough, we put that in the model, and in fact, we're able to demonstrate that, in fact, that was the best thing to do. So what happens is if they get a headgate wa head washout, they switch to the 12 or 24 hour um, uh, situations based on kind of what the flow rate is. The 12 hour is the most equitable and higher performance. The 24 hour is not, never the higher, highest performing uh, solution, but it's the most equitable under terrible conditions. So their switching also has a social uh, feature as well. It's not just biophysical. So adaptive governance, in summary, these folks can effectively coordinate these very difficult problems in the field. They can balance equity and fairness, and they can increase the robustness of the system using these adaptive institutions. Anybody who does control would know this. If you have a richer set of controls, you can do better, right? But we wanted to observe this in practice and use a model to verify uh, this process. Now, two things. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of nuance in here that I don't have time to talk about. The effectiveness of what they do depends a lot on the subtle biophysical context. You can't just port this over to anywhere, right? You have to tune it to every situation. That makes it fragile. But we also assume in the model that we don't, we're not modeling any social dilemmas. We're assuming that they, they, they cooperate perfectly. And that led us to the next question. Can they? Can they really do this? So, what we did is we, we conceptualized this problem using this thing that we're calling the coupled infrastructure system. It's a network of at least five classes of infrastructure, but it's, it's wired up this way. So think of this as plug and play. Got some resource users, <coughs> irrigators, who rely on a resource. The resource really is the watershed. It's natural infrastructure. Uh, they, they have public infrastructure providers, which in many of these small scale communities is a water users association or an actual uh, former oh. ministry, for example, the Royal Irrigation Ministry in Nepal. The public infrastructure providers provide public infrastructure, which is the canals here, which concentrate resources in space and time. That's what infrastructure does. Regulates the use and provides um, uh, incentives for maintenance from users, for example. You give me any resource system and I'll put it in this picture pretty quickly. So then we said, we're going to go to the lab and we're going to let the resource users and public infrastructure providers be university students, like typical Princeton student here. We're going to recreate this in a computer and see if these folks here can actually provide public infrastructure. Just for your information, Lynn Ostrom spent her career studying Lean 2. 
under what conditions do people come together to provide their own public infrastructure without a separate professional governing body? Okay, here's our lab. This is named after Ostrom, who made a, a donation to ASU generously to let us or help us do this work. The students play in these, uh, these uh, small uh, areas. They can't see each other or communicate other than through uh, texting to each other. And that enables us to follow what they're saying to figure out what they're doing and how they're thinking. So what we did is we took this physical system and made it into this computer game. The, the resource is a water source, canals, and each player, five players, has land. And the challenge is for them to, to, to provide governance for this system. Uh, and here's the, here are the dynamics. This, this unit here can provide 30 cubic feet per second of water. Note can, not necessarily will. The amount that is actually delivered is based on the capacity of these five players to maintain that infrastructure, the canal infrastructure. The canal infrastructure declines at 25% per, per period. This is pretty typical for these farmer managed systems. They have to clean them every year. They don't clean them, they don't work. In fact, this is probably a conservative estimate about how how much your performance drops each year in a real irrigation system. Uh, the objective of the players is to make tokens. So tokens is their crop. And you'll notice that the uh, amount of tokens increases in the sigmoidal shape with the amount of water applied. This is to create a social dilemma. So if you don't apply enough water, your crop dies. You get kind of linear increasing returns here, but then it flattens out, obviously, because some other constraining factor, soil, soil fertility, labor, some other constraint. Uh, pulls the curve over. Here, you'll find if you put too much water, you flood it. So there's a, there is an optimal amount of water you'd want to apply to get as many tokens as you could as an individual. But notice, we, we allow for 30 cubic feet per second flow. Each growing season is 50 seconds. So we have to kind of compress the growing season here to get lots of data. Those of you who do experiments understand these kinds of constraints. So you'll see there's a total of 1,500 cubic feet in each round. You can't, you can't divide that among five people and get to there. So the question is, can the, can the players get down? They can get to about 300, which is right over in here. That's, uh, if they all played fairly, they could get to that point. Uh, you'll notice here they do this in real time, which is quite different than most experiments, right? Where you play on paper, you make a decision. This is real time. They see each other. Right now, a player sees gate is open, water is flowing in. The maximum they can take is 25 cubic feet per second when they open their gate. And 30, this shows 30 cubic feet flowing. Five cubic feet is left over. Now, we let it flow out of the system if nobody takes it, but most of the time somebody's taking it. You can see the asymmetry. This is very representative of real systems. What do we find? Well, we collected data by individuals, groups, positions, chat, quiz scores. We ran with 40 groups, uh, uh, and we have found in, this, in stable environments like I just showed you, students can solve this problem, no problem, from all different backgrounds. They don't have to understand anything about irrigation or social dilemmas. Uh, and uh, they come up with their solutions based on simple fairness and common sense. Uh, hey, player A, give us some water or we're not going to invest. Hey, player C is going, hey, give D some water because, you know, it's not cool to, to uh, take all the water. We can track all this in their comments. And one of my students wrote what I thought was a really fun paper analyzing the discussion and the emergence of different positions, in, you know, sense makers, enforcers in these systems over time. That's another story, but uh, an interesting offshoot of this. They, to they tolerate moderate inequalities, I'll show you here. And as I said, they don't have to understand the system very well at all. So question, how robust is this cooperation to environmental variation? Can they still solve the problem if they face variation like real irrigators would? So then, instead of the 25% degradation and 30 cubic feet per second, we did two treatments. This is a moderate variability treatment here and a high variability treatment here, the white. You'll see here these two big shocks. We put those two big shocks in uh, because those would completely destroy the head gates and the students would have to, the participants would have to come together and invest enough to rebuild the head gate infrastructure. And if they didn't, they completely lose the system. So we tried to generate different treatments that would enable, uh, would enable us to replicate what goes on maybe in the system behind that picture. This just shows you the dynamics. This isn't very interesting. We play 20 rounds. The first 10 are stable. So they, 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 they live in a stable world. They converge pretty quickly to the optimal efficiency. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you can see that the group earnings across the treatments don't vary hugely. Then when we add the, the variation, you see that the group earnings and investments start to <coughs> change. Is it, is it
No, they did not. They were just told, you're, you're now playing with, okay, so at round 10, after round 10, we tell them, okay, in the next, in the next 10 rounds, you're going to play, but now, instead of 25%, it's going to vary. And they did not know what, how it's going to No, vary. they did not know. Correct. This is a, this is a, a not that informative of a slide, but it just kind of shows you what's going on. Here is the uncertainty case. Uh, the gray and the black is a certainty case. Not a huge difference, actually. Average performance. Uh, same thing uh, in terms of investment and in, in terms of uh, there's a little more drop in performance when we add the noise. The interesting thing about this slide is, though, that D and E continue to invest when proportionally they get quite a bit less tokens. In fact, they, many of them were investing uh, uh, too much. They should have just kept their tokens because they're what they got from farming was, was less than their token value. So they should not have contributed to the public good, yet they did. So that tells us something. We don't know if it's lack of understanding. With a lot of these experiments, we have to be really careful. We don't know if they just don't get it, and they're just, they're just doing it because, which may be how actual governance in the real world actually works, right? Let us not over-intellectualize about it. But the key thing I just wanted to show you here is just kind of the landscape of what we see. But this averaging masks the interesting stuff. Uh, the interesting stuff is that we had certain groups who did beautifully <coughs> and other groups completely crashed, which is shown as an average here. But averages are, you know, like when we talk about climate change, well, the average temperature across the globe is going to do blah, whereas the weather here is going up and down by 50 degrees, and that's very different than that average temperature. So what we did is we did some statistics uh, to try to understand this, the, the interactions between various factors. And I just want to point out a couple of things here. Uh, I'm sorry these, you know, these econometrics or statistical tables I know are always terrible to put in a talk, but this is a little bit of laziness in the sense that it's the easiest way for me to get those numbers up there, so I'm going to help you out. Quiz questions correct. Makes no difference in the stable environment. Basic common sense and fairness works fine. It makes a huge difference when things get variable. So somebody has to know how the system works. How did we determine this? We play a practice round or two, then we have the students take a, participants, I have to say, participants take a, take a quiz, and we can tell by the quiz how well they understood the game. And those groups where somebody, at least somebody in the group, understands the game better, they did much better because they'd be saying, hey, wait, we actually need to maintain 40 cubic, uh, cubic feet per second capacity because they can overinvest. The water source can only deliver on average 30, but they can build the canal so it will deliver 40. So if somebody really understands, they can go, hey, we need to get it up to 40 because when the, when the water goes above the average, we can exploit it. And there are some people who just understood that, so they would do much better. The other thing that's really much more interesting to us is as follows. What is, how, what is the effect of fairness? So we computed the Gini coefficient for the collection of tokens and the investment. We see that in the, in the, in the stable case that inequality has a negative impact, lack of fairness. But here it even has a much higher impact. Notice here that the, the, the Gini of investment by the way, I, I, I failed to tell you, in each round, the students make an investment decision. Then they're shown what everybody's investment decision is. They don't know who they are. They just see A invested this, B invested that. After the round, after the agricultural round, so you have a chat round, investment decision, uh, growing season. At the end of the growing season, they're shown what everybody's crop harvest was. So they all know what everybody's doing. They just don't know who it is. That's the point of the, the blinders in the, in the lab. So, Notice that the genie of investment, the inequality in investment, has no impact in rounds 1 through 10. It had no impact either within round or in the future. Notice here it did, and this is an interesting uh, uh, potential finding, I think, that people start to pay attention to investment, but they don't pay attention to collection when they did here. What we think is going on is the following. When there's variability in the environment, People don't know why there is variability in the tokens collected. They might think that it has to just do with variation. But when they look at investment, that's not subject to any variation. They can tell what people are investing. So we think that they're just focusing on this information source to gauge inequality, which definitely has an impact. There are lots of fun nuances in this study, in fact, that uh, I don't have time to chat about uh, here, but um, really interesting. So what does this tell us? Well. Again, adaptive institutions confer robustness from the model, but there's some emerging fragility in, again, this tight coupling and fine-tuning with biophysical context. But collective action, it does depend on equity and understanding of the system. 
What do we think may happen with globalization? More people work outside their community. They lose expertise in agriculture. We're seeing that happen already. How many of you love jasmine rice from Thailand? Who would prefer jasmine? I would too. Jasmine rice is very specific. It's grown in a very specific place and people need to know what they're doing. More and more of those people are working in Bangkok. They're not doing this anymore. They might go do just like a uh, broadcast, you know, not, not heavy uh, uh, intensive agricultural techniques. They broad, broadcast some rice and they grow some for their family. When they lose that knowledge, it's gone. So this is, a, this is important, this, this understanding, oops, this understanding of the system. Uh, and of course, what's going to happen with equity as people move outside of the, the system and start to work outside? Do those people who work in wage-based occupations start to have more? Is there more inequality? How is that going to impact these systems? Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting question and a concern. So then the last thing, uh, the two more things, uh, we go back to this, this kind of cycle of research and said, well, this is with students. This is with participants. This is with the people of you who do behavioral economy, the weird people, Western, industri Western European, industrialized, you know, that, those people. Let's go to the field. Those uh, uh, points I showed you earlier is where we took this uh, field. So we, we did some new field experiments that emphasize risk perception, and then we finish up with a dynamic model. So here's where we went. Went to China, Thailand, Nepal, Colombia. Field sites were, show, were chosen for some gradation across market integration, uh, wealth indexes, uh, size, how much rice is grown for, within the community and outside, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but they're also you know, restricted by our practical con constraints. We do our best with where we can get, where we have field personnel, so on and so forth. We did these experiments in 120 villages. Uh, using pencil and paper. But what did we do? We went in 2013, myself, Marco Janssen, and Juan Camilo Cardenas, whom some of you may know from the cross-cultural studies of dictator games. That's uh, uh, one of the earliest pioneering papers in this area. Uh, we found that the irrigation game, we actually went out to the field in Thailand and ran a pilot with the irrigation game that we ran in the lab. And there was just no way. It's too complicated. The irrigators understood it much better, but it took too long to run. It wasn't clear whether we were going to be able to compare it, so we shifted gears and we decided that we would focus, uh, focus on uh, risk perception and play a standard public goods game with two variations in the treatment. Uh, I have a picture here of one of our personnel in the field in Colombia just to show you kind of the conditions under which we run these experiments so the, the real-time irrigation game isn't going to work. So here's the choice. It's a linear public good game. We play with 20 players when we could. Sometimes we just couldn't. Somebody wouldn't show up because they have to work. Uh, we usually have, I think, average 17 players, 16 to 20 kind of players. So you can keep your endowment. You're given a token. You keep your endowment. It's worth $8 or 20 renminbi or whatever, Thai bot. This is, uh, yeah, uh, that's, we didn't, that's the currency in US terms, but we, we use local currency. Then you can contribute to the public good which means you give your token to the public good. And the payout is, uh, it's the number of tokens times $1 to each player. So two predictions. Nash equilibrium is everyone keeps their tokens and each earns $8, right? Nobody contributes because they don't trust that anybody else will. And you can work out with whatever method you like that that's a Nash equilibrium. The cooperative equilibrium, on the other hand, is that everybody contributes to the public good. Each earns 20. So there's clearly an incentive to cooperate if you trust the other players are going to cooperate rationally. <clears throat> you can see that there's a strong incentive to defect, meaning you keep your eight and hope that everybody else won't. Right? Well, if, they, if, if that's the case, you keep your eight, 19 people contribute, you get $19 even if you didn't contribute. That's like using the irrigation canal even if you didn't contribute to your annual labor to maintain it. Right? Uh, you would earn 27. So there's, there's a strong incentive to, to defect as well. Uh, Juan Camilo Cardenas, uh, my uh, close collaborator on this project, is a brilliant experimenter in the field. The way, we, the way we constructed the experiment was to have the participants tear off their choice and put it in, uh, uh, put it in a hat and we could uh, determine the play that way. Then we tried to collect all sorts of data along the way, which I'll talk about in a minute. The next two treatments we did, um, uh, add some uncertainty. So we played three rounds. 
Round one is the base round, standard public good game that I just showed you. Round two is uh, you have, oops, you have risk on the private asset. So if you keep your token, instead of getting eight, you get zero or 16 with probability 0.5. So we're, we're kind of putting, putting risk on the wage labor market in this case. Round three, uh, we put risk on the public asset. So instead of getting $1 for each token, you get zero or two with probability 0 0.5. So we, we have two treatments, one with risk on a private asset, one with risk on the shared asset. And we, uh, in our treatments across the 120 communities, we, we alternated these rounds to control for learning effects, and we found that. OK. Now, we also want to know a lot about the communities. What's motivating them to make their decisions? So what did we do? We have them also make other kind of, play other kind of games as well. This one is, how much do you think other players will contribute? And they would simply tear off where they thought. So if they tore here, they would think that you know, most people are going to contribute. If they, tore, if they gave the whole thing back, we would say, oh, they don't think anybody's going to contribute. So this is just a visual way for the participants to, dis to gauge the level of trust in their, in their group. <clears throat> Next, we wanted to study their risk aversion. Many of you have probably seen this game if you do any behavioral economics. Uh, each one of these, you're, you're asked to pick a lottery. Each lottery is increasing in expected value as you go around the circle. But also, variance is increasing. So risk averse people don't like increasing variance, so they're going to stay down here. This one would be the choice of the risk-neutral risk player because that has the highest expected value. So risk-neutral players just pick the highest expected value. That's the rational thing to do. Finally, this is the risk-loving player who, who wants the potential of the high payoff over the other players. <clears throat> so we can measure uh, risk aversion in, the, in the, the communities. Again, well, this is pretty straightforward. I think they, they understand it pretty easily. And then we did surveys along. So we'd play the games, and our team would do surveys while in the field. And we would gather age, sex, education, household size, income, land size. We would ask questions about trust. We had five questions to augment the simple how many people are going to cooperate data. If someone loses a pig, goat, or chicken, he or she will easily find others in the community to help uh, seek it out and find it. Uh, we had five other questions so we can measure levels of trust. Then at the community level, we wanted to know what the size is, how many people working outside the community, and what what crop cultivation is grown for market, and what is eaten. So these are measures of how integrated the community is in the uh, market economy. What did we find? Uh, we found that across the baseline, pu pu public asset, private asset, that the impact of uh, uncertainty was definitely to reduce contributions to the uh, public good, the shared resource. Interestingly, uh, the impact of, of um, putting risk on the private infrastructure was very different. Notice in Thailand, if you put risk on the private asset, more people contributed. So they're willing to run away from private, private assets towards collective assets that are less risky. We don't know how to interpret this, actually, but it's, a, it's an empirical pattern here. Um, uh, interestingly, China and Thailand uh, seem, to, seem to have that impact more so than the others, Colombia as well. Um, so, Interesting aggregate statistics, not the most interesting that thing that comes out of the, the work. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture showing the impact of the percentage of crops grown for the market on the fraction of uh, investment in the public good. You can see there's a lot of spread, but this is a statistically significant uh, negative relationship. Likewise, the percentage of food produced in the own community strongly increases the uh, amount you would, con you would contribute to the public good in the game. A lot of spread, but those are statistically significant. Um, this picture shows the percentage of, popula uh, percentage of the population driving wages outside the village. You can see here that, that there's a strong negative impact here on the contributions. This is the change in contributions as a function of this, much more so than on the private assets. So clearly, participation outside of the community in wage activities <coughs> makes people more sensitive to, and this is across all four countries, makes people more sensitive to uh, this risk on the shared asset. Finally, this is the uh, trust versus trustworthiness question. So when you engage with the trust literature, you will find that people talk about two things. You're trusting, you trust people, or you are trustworthy. It may be that very trustworthy people are not very trusting people, right? So there's an interesting dichotomy there. Basically, this picture shows that if you trust your, if you trust 
in your community. If you're, if, if you're in a community where you can trust your neighbor, they will be trustworthy. So this is indicating levels of trust, and of course, this is the fraction invested, what, they, what you expect them to do, what they actually do in the community. So this is kind of an interesting uh, set of uh, ideas from experiments that tell us that greater integration of small-scale agricultural communities with the global economy will lead to a lower level of cooperation within the community members and uh, increasing variability and uncertainty will reduce cooperation. And this has implications for food security. Remember, I started out by saying that 90% that, uh, of all these farms worldwide are small and they produce a lot of <coughs> food for, for um, poorer populations. So this is a concern that, that this market integration will definitely erode or may erode their capacity to manage these shared resources at the community scale. So therefore, uh, the vulnerability of food production of small scale systems is increasing with globalization, potentially. Okay, I have five more minutes to share one last journey with you. So we've had a model, two experiments, and then we're going to go back to a final model. And, th and this one's very abstract. So this, this object, uh, this object of the coupled infrastructure system, motivates our comparative research, motivates our experimental research, and also motivates our mathematical research. So just imagine n resource users who are using some resource R, and that resource renews itself. And they, are, they contribute to a group of public infrastructure providers who then maintain the public infrastructure. So in this very abstract setting, our question is, under what conditions would we think we could generate an emergent coupled infrastructure system where there are people using the local resource and there are public infrastructure providers providing the public infrastructure necessary to exploit that resource? Uh, three differential equations. We have, we have uh, human-made infrastructure that this is, a, this is just a long multiplication of resources directed at maintaining it and it wears out at rate delta. That human-made infrastructure enables the group to harvest from the resource. This is H of IM. This is the key thing. The relationship between human-made infrastructure and its usefulness is lumpy. In other words, if you build just the headgate canal, you don't get anything out of it. If you build just the trunk road and forget the bridge, you don't get anything out of it. So you have to get to a certain point, which we call I minimum, at which you get enough infrastructure to actually make it useful. This is like a von Liebig law of the minimum, right? You have to get some minimum infrastructure in place before you get output. And then once you get that output, there's some other limiting factor. So this is a critical aspect of shared infrastructure and scaled infrastructure. You have to get enough of it before it's useful. So the, uh, the resource users, they, they uh, allocate proportion U of their time to harvesting the resource. They extract, the total extraction is the number of resource users times the proportion of time. So this is their total community time times the resource availability R times its harvestability. So this is, a, this is like a fishery model, the same kind of simple fishery model. So they extract stuff. So this could be fishing effort, vessel days per year. This could be fish biomass. This could be agriculture hours per year. This can be rice uh, biomass. Then they sell that harvest at price P, which is taxed at rate C by the public infrastructure providers. Now here we assume the public infrastructure providers are professionals. This is the case in many developing countries like the Royal Irrigation Ministry. And those public infrastructure providers have a choice. Do I stay with this system and invest or do I leave? Maybe they don't leave, but they can definitely shift attention around as to which systems they think are worth investing in and which ones they might leave to the farmers. This, of course, is related to this process of decentralization, whereby <coughs> government agencies are saying, you know, we're going de to devolve responsibility to you, the farmers, but it's up to you to run it. So this captures this process. Finally, uh, the resource is really straightforward. It grows, it, it naturally depreciates, and then the extraction reduces it. This is a replicator dynamic. If any of you have done re uh, replicator dynamics, evolution of game theory, uh, the, the users compare their outside wage to the, uh, the, the profit they get from growing crops or harvesting resources. It's bi-stable, multiple stability domains here. Uh, you see here different trajectories. These are for different parameter values for the amount of investment C, uh, sorry, the taxation and investment. The red curve here shows that, that uh, C and Y are 
in an area where the system can't be maintained. So you get some increase in users, but then the, the, the uh, infrastructure runs down, boo, and then everybody leaves, the resource is pristine, and there's no infrastructure, no people. Okay? This green is the other story, where you invest enough, you get some increase, but then the system stabilizes around where you'd expect it would, right? At, this is non-dimensionalized, of course. This, the system stabilizes at IM, uh, there's perfectly maintained infrastructure. About 50% of the, the people's time is used in, in the extraction of resources, and the resource is heavily exploited. But this resource is linear, so that doesn't hurt the resource. It's like water. You know, they're using the water well, so to speak. I just want to finish with a little story about policy that's shown in these pictures down here. These pictures show the strategy space of the public infrastructure providers. What do I do? What tax do I charge, and how much do I actually invest in infrastructure? That's a pretty common story even today. How much do we tax? How much do we invest in infrastructure? How much do we pay ourselves? That's what's uh, the trade-off here. In this blue region, or this gray region, those are all the feasible combinations of C and Y that will lead to an interior solution here, where there's, there's, there's infrastructure, the system is functioning, and there are people in the system. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting sub-regions here. This is the line below which the, the infrastructure collapses. This is the line above which it makes no point to invest more. This is the participation constraint of the public infrastructure providers. Above that, they leave. The tax is high enough, but the investment is too high. They can't pay themselves. Uh, anywhere outside of that, they leave. The interesting thing, the last kind of story I wanted to tell, was along this line, this is, maximizes total social welfare. I don't know if you can see it here, but there's a white star here. That's what maximizes the income of the public infrastructure provider. Notice, in here, in this region, it's unstable. There's a bifurcation from here, from a stable fixed point, to an os oscillatory fixed point. So you're next to an edge, it's oscillating, and you get a shock. You can collapse very easily if you push the system to its performance frontier. These, are, uh, these show contours of participation. Uh, point one up to point six. As you move this direction, you get more participation, right? You tax less and you invest more. You get more participation, so if your objective is to, to increase livelihoods, you want to move over in this direction. So these are the kind of governance choices that, that the, the, the public infrastructure providers have to make. Finally, this is the actual output. So up here you get more and more output from the system, but it's distributed differently. So this kind of shows you a, a governance space in this very simple representation of of uh, uh, a coupled infrastructure system. Okay, final remarks. I, what I tried to do here is to show you how we use multiple methods to unpack each of the subcomponents in this system. All of our research domains are always unpacking one of these. You know, hydrologists, ecologists, political scientists, you know, voting systems. Here is again voting systems, behavioral economics, economics, sociology. We're always unpacking these, but what we're trying to do here is unpack each of these components with different techniques and ideas, put them back together as systems, study how those systems uh, evolve over time in terms of global change kinds of time scales. And finally, I leave you with the hardest question of all, and that is, how do we scale up our insights? So Lynn Ostrom's work really focused on small scale communities, and she did an amazing amount of work. She, she tried to work on understanding how to scale this up, but it's extremely difficult to do. And that's the kind of place we are now where we're thinking, how do we scale up our understanding? Does it scale? Do we, can we ever scale up what we understand from these small scale communities to the nation state, for example? So all of you with, with your uh, research endeavors can try to address that question. So thanks for listening. This is all my co-conspirators here, wonderful team across uh, all those spaces. And I, uh, uh, Gladly acknowledge uh, support from the National Science Foundation on two sequential grants that started way back, I think, in 2010. And I just wrapped this one up a couple of months ago. So that sort of took us nine, eight or nine years to do that sequence of modeling, experiments, and modeling. So happy to take questions. You'll recognize people yourself. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And all of you who are leaving, I understand where you're going, so. <laughs> yes? I have two kinds of questions. First of all, very specific questions. The river that you began with. Yeah. Who controls the runoff into this little subsystem? <laughs> this river system here, uh, 
uh, who controls the runoff is, yeah. is the community who builds the bigger dam. So there's a higher level coordination problem as well. So um, there are many of these strung out along that Pumper River. So there's no overarching authority controlling the total flow in this river. And the biophysical context is important there because it's fast running. It's very difficult for any one community to grab it all. Yeah. Uh, can I ask another question? Sure. sure. Uh, it wasn't clear to me in this, this kind of modeling what happens over time. I mean, people are leaving the countryside, all kinds of productivity issues are coming. It wasn't clear how that fitted into this model. Right. Whether there's how this underlying dynamics, which this is sort of embedded in, impacts the, these models. I had a discussion with a group of students this morning, I think we were talking about our capacity to understand all the dynamics that are going on in these systems. In this particular model, we shut all that down. And we asked only, what is the limit of the capacity of the institutions to deal with the problems they have at that scale? Now, interesting that you say that. There is a fascinating array of historical norms and institutions and, and paths that have led to this structure. And it turns out that when things are really bad, uh, folks up here share with people down here in a number of ways. So there are other kinds of mechanisms that deal with these subtle issues. People are not leaving this system as much as they are other systems. But you're right, in these other systems, how we cope with those, those higher level demographic and uh, economic processes is very difficult. Which is what we tried to capture in that super general model. Yeah. Yes? So what happens if you add variability to the dynamical system? For example, in the, some environmental variable that it, controls the, res the resource. In this one? No, no, in the, in the final, in the dynamical system, uh, the theoretical one. Great question. So we haven't studied that yet. We'd love to. But you know Chot. He loves these kinds of things. I, he's working on this now. Um, what, we, what we can say without actually uh, explicitly adding, sorry to make you ill here by clicking. What we can say without explicitly adding the uncertainty or the variability is that in the, in the best case scenario, we have these two, two domains, right? We have this, we have this uh, in this little wedge here, we have this space where the system's stable. So if you're being knocked around in here by variability, right, in terms of, you know, you're, you're, you're in, regardless, you're, the total amount of, uh, sorry, how do I say this? You pick a certain strategy here, but the system is being knocked around. This whole space is moving around under you because the other parameters are changing. Uh, we can say that in this region, if you start moving yourself around in that region, certainly you're going you're to have a higher probability of being flipped uh, or experiencing a tipping point or phase transition regime shift into this range here where the system collapses. Uh, explicitly studying that in terms of frequencies and amplitudes, wonderful next step, absolutely. And that's, that's what we'd like to do. Are you trying to use this work to influence any decisions, either at a communal level or at a government level, or you're just learning? Not that learning is bad, but Yes, no, I, I, I fully understand. We, uh, we are trying to use this work at two levels. Um, and I say trying. But when we, when we completed this, uh, this work with this experiment, we went back to our group in Thailand, uh, our collaborator there, Ganesh Shivakati, who worked with Lynn for many years in Nepal. Uh, we went back to the field and we took these results to the farmers. We talked to them about what they were thinking about it, whether they thought it was reasonable. Are people really leaving? Do you find if those people, uh, when they leave, if they contribute less? Is it a stress on your community? So on and so forth. So through this dialogue with the actual participants, we feel like we are helping them see these social dilemmas in different ways that then enables them perhaps to, to deal with these social dilemmas. Um, we would like to work at a more formal level, but we find that more difficult because then at that level, the participants in that interaction, they want more rigor, but we're not sure we can give it to them. We can only say general things about how these systems evolve. So I see a hand here and here. So I think yours was first and then over this one. Well, maybe just on this experiment. Um, I was curious, like, so you, you mentioned how, like, if like the, the participants had more risk in their private assets, they would be more likely to contribute to the public good. And inversely, if there was risk in the public good, then they would want to keep more 
kind of like do you depending see, on country. Yeah. Right. So so extrapolate. This might be too much extrapolation, but like with increasing variability with climate change and things like that, do you see like kind of would this potentially predict like a huge oscillation between you know people start contributing more to the public good as their private assets get risked, but then if the private or the public goods that they build up get risked, then they like then want to become more private goods, and then they yeah. kind of oscillate back and forth. Um, I think if they oscillated, that would be a great outcome. But I see a. I'm more concerned about another possibility is that, um, and we can, we, with our contacts, the people we work with in the field, we can somewhat verify some of these demographic processes. It's difficult. I mean, just a second. Um, uh, what I see happening potentially is that once the wage starts to pull people and they contribute less, then the, the infrastructure will then begin to perform less well. And if it gets down here, it's gone and then everybody leaves. And then there's no more agriculture in that place. Now, maybe market dynamics will fix that. Maybe food will then become more expensive, and then you know, maybe, maybe it will be, then become more profitable to go back. But remember the information. Remember the knowledge experiment. Oh, well, gee, I, I forgot how to do agriculture. My dad did, or my mom did, but I don't know how to do it. So then that asset is subject to this lock-in or inertia effects that come from this. So, sir. There is one factor that you did not take into account. It turns out that the population of Nepal was 10 million in 1960. It is 30 million today. It is safe to assume that it will be twice as much by 2050. So whatever planning you do to get your system working, the, the fact that the demand will increase Whereas the supply of the natural resource will not at best be constant. Yep. A, a very, it's not the most important problem. Absolutely. So let me just go back to this slide in the beginning. What what you're saying is, I think that, sorry, there should be a way to go to a particular slide, right? Or maybe I just shouldn't do this. What you're saying is, what is the point? Why why focus on these small scale systems? Why should we care? I agree at the aggregate level. We've got such gigantic problems in terms of total load on the biosphere, you know, the whole planetary boundaries question. Uh, gee, thinking about getting these small scale systems to work well may not be the biggest factor. But on the other hand, if we don't, at least in the next 20 years, 20 to 30 years, this could cause big problems. So this, this story, I think, only holds for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Beyond that, it's such a different ball game. I don't know what to say. I did mean a small system because what is true for Nepal is true for lots of other players on Earth. If yeah. All of them. Right. So, so I didn't mean to criticize the fact that Nepal was a small example. Oh no, no, no. Example because, but it applies to everything else. Right. What I meant was small-scale systems like these, not not Nepal small, but like you say. These are ubiquitous in China, Nepal, Colombia. Well, Colombia is a little more industrialized and market oriented. But yeah, I, I was just talking about the small scale ag, not the country scale. But you're right. This story is only going to be important uh, or interesting for the next 10, 20, 30 years, where if we can do some good in that time period, we can at least avoid shorter term drops. But in the bigger picture, yeah, I, that's beyond my beyond my research capacity at this point? It's a good question. Thank you for saying so. Sure. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, so your point at the end about uh, scaling things up. Yeah. And you're talking about small scale, that there's a limit to scale. I'm wondering, what, what is your definition of scale? And can you identify the upper limit for what you're doing here? Yes. Um, uh, when we first started thinking in terms of this coupled infrastructure system thing, which we called social ecological system at the time for reasons I chatted with students, you know, you can't invent new language too fast or no one will read it or understand what it is. Um, uh, we were thinking about scale and levels of organization, which we see as different. So scales, spatial, temporal scales, mainly spatial scales here, which are then measured by proxies of population size. This case that I showed you is 120 households. Then we have levels of organization. So uh, as you move up, you have multiple levels of organization, which then have jurisdiction over larger scales, maybe or maybe not. This idea of polycentricity suggests that that can be kind of a fluid relationship. In terms of these small scale systems and what we can say, uh, uh, I would say the upper limit 
for observed, successful, self-organizing governance structures about 10,000 people in India. Now, I don't think that, that number's big and it's very specific to that system. I'm thinking order of at magnitudes of thousands, you know, 1,000, 500, 1,000, 1,500. That's kind of the limit at which these systems can function well. But at that limit, they function really well and they can't be easily replaced by top-down governance. Because the, the government can't get there. They can't reach that point no matter how hard they try. Yeah, and, and yeah, and command area. Command area, number of individuals. Yeah. Okay, is there a last question before we adjourn? Thank you very much. My pleasure.